Hey everybody. Uh, hope everybody is having an unbelievable uh, week to this point, man. We're halfway through the week. Lots going on for the guys who love football, man. We're almost there. Uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, first day. Hey, uh, uh, but on a on a serious note, man, this is Wednesday, so this is Wealth Building Wednesday. This is a special Wealth Building. Wednesday. My focus and my attention and my message is for people in the black community. Uh, while I have an open economy business, most of my models aren't just aimed at any particular group. They're aimed at helping uh, people do specific things. And if I were, I'd probably be broke right now if it was just focus in this community. But anybody knows me knows that my love is for uh, my people. And I have done uh, as much as I can to show love, to help encourage, to help empower uh, my people. So while my businesses are open economy, my focus today is specifically in areas where I have created mechanisms for blacks, for black people, because our particular situation, especially on a socioeconomic scale, is unique our experience financially is unique our view of money is unique and i want to show people something so there's always this great debate going on about financial literacy and what it means and if you don't understand what financial literacy means if there's a level, level of ignorance about money then it's going to be hard to see how to move and operate with money we talk a great deal about black wall street we talk about what they were able to do and why they were able to do it and don't realize how and why they were able to do it. Number one, they were pretty much forced into it. Uh, they had skills, they had goods, they had things that were needed, but they weren't necessarily going to be able to move that in any other area. And each person needed it. It was just simply natural to exchange those things. So what happens is you spent your money with who would, who would spend their money with you and who would buy your goods. And it happened to be people who looked like you. And what happened is that was a development and an understanding of how things work on a uh, vertical uh, economic scale of manufacturing distribution and retail in any type of situation. And so that's what they produced. It was simply a natural forced, uh, forced phenomenon, so to speak. And it wasn't just happening in Tulsa. It was happening in Slocum, Texas. It was happening in Rosewood. It was happening in Wilmington, North Carolina. It was happening in East St. Louis. It was happening in certain areas of Chicago. It was happening in a bunch of different areas that we had a large pop, uh, a significant population in it because it was just natural. We weren't going to sell our goods to them and they didn't want us buying theirs. So then that was this natural force that forced us basically to do what we should be doing anyway. But that's on the back end of the scale. So how do you create this process of generating revenue? How do you create this process of growing wealth? What are some of the things that stop us? What are some of the systemic uh, problems that we have? Some of the political problems we have? I answered all of that in my book, The War on Black Wealth, uh, Breaking the Code of Generational Wealth. Uh, I answered that and talked about, there's so much that has happened um, over the last 150 years that has impacted our capacity, our understanding, and, and, and basically the totality of how we view money. And so I want to talk about the importance of financial literacy in a way that I hope I take the lid off of get, and give it some understanding. Because on the surface, uh, it's hard to talk about financial literacy when the light bill is due. It's hard to talk about financial literacy when you're trying to figure out how to get the kids school clothes. It's hard to talk about financial literacy when you're trying to make sure you pay the rent or you pay the mortgage and you're in survival mode. Survival mode is one of the worst places to be in psychologically and talking about creating a system of uh, power economically. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you something that's going to sound absolutely foolish because that's how we've been led to think. That's what we've been told and that's how we move and how we operate. I'm going to tell you that no matter where you're at, there's a way out. There's no simple, easy, magical button you push. There's no get rich quick scheme. The lotto isn't it. And a bunch of these other little things we do where we play, play games with our money and, and hope we hit isn't it. It's a systemic and processed way. And I'm going to show it to you in a second. Uh, after I wrote The War on Black Wealth, which was my 25th book, 
uh, I'm about to uh, close the deal before the end of the year on book number 27. But this is my 25th book. After I did that, I went ahead and published a uh, online course that I had been working on literally for 10 years. I interviewed top investors, top money makers, the people who literally have made their money by making their money make money. In other words, they didn't get it because they came up with some uh, new uh, technolo technological advancement. They didn't make it because they came up with this great idea, Jeff Bezos, uh, all those people who made their money off of an idea. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about people who sit up and say, hey, look, I'm going to buy a piece of this and I'm going to hold it. I'm going to buy a piece of this. And when it grows, I'm going to sell it. Those type of people who understand how you start something and you build something. Obviously, everybody's not starting at the same place. So then I said, well, how do how do I or how will I make this relative to someone who's trying to just make sure that they got the kids lunch money? Uh, someone who is just trying to make sure. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about there are enough of us that are at or below the poverty line that the idea of wealth is just totally out of our head. And so what do we do? We don't even pursue it. We stay in survival mode our entire life. It impacts our health. It impacts our fluidity. It also conditions the minds of our children to do the absolute same thing we're doing and we repeat the cycle and it produces the same thing. So you got to understand that social learning thing theory. And then there's also the, 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 the environmental socialization that takes place with your kids watching you do something over and over again and becoming conditioned to do the same thing, even if it's not comfortable. It's just simply why you get generation after generation. And then someone in somebody's family breaks out and no matter how well they break out, they tell the family, the family can't do it. Why the family's still conditioned. So then it's about changing. So I had to come up with programs. So I created the program and I'll talk to you about the online stuff later, but if you want to get involved and you really want to take this serious and you really want to do something with it, there are two different programs in there that you need to take advantage of. Look in there and see it. I may talk about it later. I may not, but it's your responsibility to start pursuing the things that change your life. The idea that your life cannot be changed is absolute crap. The problem is you've been conditioned to believe that they control everything. They control a lot. They're pulling the strings. You have, by most chance has been engineered into the position you're in, but you don't have to stay there, but you're going to have to think different. You're going to have to move different. So one of the things I decided to do was, okay, Rick, don't think as if you're talking to people who think like you, who are willing to take a chance and get out there and build something for yourself and do that. See, don't think that. Think about the person who literally thinks if I lose this job, my life is going to turn upside down. I mean, talk to that person. Think about what they're thinking. Think about the concerns they have going on. Think about the person who has three, four or five kids and they're trying to figure out how to feed them. And there's this option of trying to do this. And then there's this system that's saying, hey, we'll feed them for you. But this is all you're going to get. And this is what going. This is where you qualify. And it literally locks them into this mindset of not disqualifying themselves for that help. So they never step outside of that box. There's so many mind games being played that we aren't aware of. I said, so what can I do? OK, I thought about John Crowley. And I'm going to tell you about John Crowley. I thought about Theodore Johnson. I'm going to tell you about Theodore Johnson. Those are people who were average people who didn't make a lot of money who ended up building wealth. And they did it in a systematic way that anybody can do it. But I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm going to tell you about me. I'm going to tell you about what I did the last five years. The last five years, five years ago, a little over five years ago, I decided I'm going to create this dummy account. Now I'm going to make it for my youngest daughter, who at the time I think was four. She's nine now. Uh, I'm going to make it for her. And this is going to be one of the accounts I have for her, but I'm going to make it for her. And I'm going to do this. What I did was, and I have the numbers sitting right here. What I did was I took $5 and bought into the Vanguard S&P 500, $5. That $5 was followed by $4 and 60 cents a week for five years. I invested in that five years, a total of $245. The S&P 500 had a payout of roughly around 9.8 to 10% with a uh, interest variance of anywhere from 1% to 1.5. So the variance up and down either over or under was uh, somewhere 1.5 or lower. I accounted for that, but I, I anticipated I would make $1,500 in five years. I literally said, I'm going to pay this out in five years, real time, no if, ands, and buts, no guessing, no projections, no if this happens. This is literally what happened. 
okay, over that five years, uh, $4.60. I only invested in that five years, $240. I anticipated based on interest variance uh, uh, projections that I would make $1,500. Did not quite hit that, but I made $1,473.28 from $245. Now, it took five years, but that was $245 at $4.60 a week. Let me tell you something. I don't care where you're at on the socioeconomic scale. I don't care where you're at. You're blowing $4.60 a week doing something you don't necessarily need. And no, that isn't going to make you rich, but that's five years. Now, guess what you, What happens when you take that and double it? And that's going to grow. If you, if I never add anything else to it, it's going to grow off of itself and the interest. It's going to compound. It's going to keep compounding. Now, imagine by the time she's 20, what that's going to be. And this isn't her real account. This is just me taking it and making it as skimpy as I possibly could. And this is the numbers I got. Now, the beautiful thing is there are tons of, I use the investor.gov interest rate calculator when I'm calculating interest. And you should calculate interest on your purchases as well, because that interest you're paying on your purchases is counting against your wealth. It's counting against what you build. You need to understand everything's cost what it costs to make a trade, what it costs to buy into an investment, what it's going to cost in tax liability, what is, this going to, what is it going to cost over time? You need to be that. You, you realize that the average person pays 10 times what their house is worth over 30 years? Compound debt. Why not take it and flip it to the other side what the wealthy do, get compound growth? That's all I did is I took something that paid compound growth and I used it with the idea that I don't have any money, but I'm going to sacrifice $5 up front and $4.60 a week. And I took that total of, in five years, $245, and it earned me $1,473.20, over $1,200 earned from that. Now, that's real time, real happening. Nobody else's story. This is what I'm telling you I did as a um, uh, as an experiment. Now, first and foremost, the mindset that's even willing to do that experience, to sit up and say, I'm going to start something that I can't even talk about for five years. And I'm going to stick with it and I'm going to follow through with it. Uh, and it was easy because I just set it up and it went in at that amount. And that's what it produced. And if you want to know how I came up with the $4.60, I didn't actually come up with $4.60. How I ended up with $4.60 is I said, okay, I'm going to give $5. I said, I'm going to give $5 initially, and then I'm going to give $20 a month. And then I said, well, $20 a month, if somebody's really struggling and they're trying to put something aside and they got $20 and something pops up, they're going to put that $20 on something. But a lot of people get paid once a week. So what if I broke that 20? What if I said twenty dollars times 12, which is a year? 20, so 12 months times 20, that's two hundred and forty dollars. Now divide that by what? Fifty two. And that's how I came with the four sixty. So it, it's made to pay every week. Why? Because that small increment, you're going to be more willing to put in. And um, it, it's a lot of people get paid every week. Well, you can put it in based on however you get paid, but you come up with an amount that you're going to give. You're going to be consistent with it and you do it and you stick with it. And that's what happened. And these, these are the numbers. Now, let me tell you about John Crowley. John Crowley uh, never made more than $12 a year. He was a parking lot attendant. He set up and he ran a parking lot, but he happened to run the parking lot in the financial district. You probably heard me tell this story before. Black man had kids, had a wife, had to take care of the family. $12 an hour, but he happened to work in the financial district. So he started hitting up the people who parked in his parking lot for financial advice. They told him where to uh, invest his money. They told him about the importance of diversifying his portfolio. They told him how to do the research. And he literally did that. He continued on. He never quit his job. He retired from that job, never making more than $12 an hour with a portfolio uh, uh, and net worth of well over half a million dollars, having paid off his house, having sent his kids to school. So then what, it, what, what, what happened is this is another story of a person who wasn't wealthy. Now, here's the thing. And why am I talking about this? Because this, the thing, the mechanisms I'm giving you, the S&P 500, the stock market, other different mechanisms that you can find out about 
in the path to generational wealth course in the um seven day online business lunch course things like that in the the war on wealth uh war on black wealth book the things you find about are mechanisms where your where your race your color your religion your creed doesn't come into play when i when i opened that account and i started investing they didn't ask me whether i was black they didn't ask me whether i was male or female they didn't ask me how much income i had it was a real simple account. I opened up. Matter of fact, you can open up an account just like that if you got cash out right now. Oh, up, go up into it, set it up, and start today. And I don't, I don't even think you need five dollars. I think you can do it with as little as one. I know there are some out there that you can do it a little, with as little as one dollars. I started with five, and then just you know, I would literally sit up and, and set it up, and then just just go. So what am I? What am I saying that? And, and then. Theodore uh, Johnson was just a whole nother level. Again, he took 20% of his income despite only making 14,000 a year at the height. Now, 14,000 a year when he was living was definitely more than 14,000 a year now, but he still only made 14,000 a year. But he took 20% of his income uh, by advisement for someone that he trusted as a, you know, as a, a financial advisor. And he invested in stock in predominantly in compound growth. And he just consistently got paid and kept investing in it until he retired. He retired at age 62, worth $72 million. He continued to do this until his 90s. At 90, he was still alive and he gave half of it away. I'm pretty sure by now he's gone because I started reading about this guy a long time ago. But he gave half of it away at 90. I'm not here to present you with any type of panacea. They don't exist. What I'm telling you is there are mechanisms out there and mindsets that you have to change. Uh, there's no quick fix. The quick fix. Uh, I, maybe about six months ago, I stopped by a gas station. And every gas station sells lotto tickets. I stopped by a gas station. I'm behind this woman, black lady, probably in her 60s. And she's saying, give me 10 of these. And Give me 15 of these and give me these. And she's getting all these lotto tickets, uh, the scratch off kind. And she's asking for these and these and these. And then she wanted a quick pick on the actual lotto drawing. And she wants, and it came up to like 200 or something dollars. And normally I mind my business because I, I know better. But because I had to stand behind her and wait while she did this, I felt I had earned the right to say something. And it wasn't out of disrespect. It was like, hey, I wonder if she even knows. So I leaned over and I said, hey, that same 200 that you're spending. Because the, what they did is they told me. They told me, you know, the le trying to make me understand, hey, she come in here every week. She did this every week, you know. So she's getting paid from somewhere every week. And she comes in and $200 of her art and money is going on these scratch offs. Sometimes she win, sometimes she don't. But that's her way of facilitating or supplementing her income is to play this game, enrich the people who created the game and get some hits and misses along the way for herself. So I lean over and I say, hey, how you doing? I said, as you're doing that, dude, you, you, you know, 200 and something dollars. Wow. I say, do you realize you can take that same 200 dollars right now and invest it in the S&P 500 and 10 years from now? you will be in a real nice place. And if you do it every week, 10 years from now, you will be able to take care of your grandbaby. She cussed me out, gave me the business. I smiled and said, yes, ma'am, I apologize. And I went on about my business, but it's a mindset. And the mindset is built to let those who aren't aware of how things work, uh, who are ignorant of the facts. And when I use the word ignorant, I don't use it in a derogatory means. I use it in a definitive means. Everyone has a level of ignorance about something. No one knows everything. I have a level of ignorance about things, some things more than others. When I created the Legacy Wealth, Path, Legacy Wealth Academy's Path to Generational Wealth course, this 18-month course that I'm telling you about, it was beyond my pay grade. I didn't know what needed to be known to teach people what needed to be taught at this level. This is the A through Z of how you play the game and you win and you grow and you build and you see some people that are doing it and you wonder what everybody, everybody that started didn't start with a silver spoon in their mouth. Everybody that started didn't start with having all these people in their Rolodex or now in their phone that sit up and they could just call and say, hey, I need X amount of, of, of capital to it. Some people started a square here, 
a square there, a square here. And, and the crazy thing, if you go into the hood, there are cats that understand that. Some of them are using that mindset and actually coming out, but it's no different when you start in the hood. What, what do you start? When you start, in, you hustling. Let's, let's keep it real. Let's keep it real. If you grew up in the hood, you know what I'm talking about, whether you did it or not. Is, is, is not one man. I'm talking about doing something and building something that they can't take away from you, that they can't lock you up for. Look, so you go out, you say, man, I'm going to get in the game. You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what game I'm talking about. How are you going to start? And if you don't got no real money, you're going to start what? Probably moving for someone else and you selling stones and you're getting a piece of it. Or you're going to go do what? You're going to go, you're going to go, uh, uh, you're going to go, you're going to get maybe what? A quarter, right? You're going to go get an ounce. A ball, something. You're going to break it up. You're going to chop it. What you going to do? You're going to sell it what? Rock for rock. Next time, instead of getting an ounce, you're going to get two ounces. Eventually, you're going to move up to what? Quarter key. Then you're going to move up to what? Half a key. Then you're going to move up to a key. And you're moving it rock for rock. Then you start getting some other little cats to move it for you. Now, what do you do? You got them breaking down one key. You're buying two keys. You got them breaking down one key, selling rock for rock. It's more profit than that. But you got another key. You're going to sell that key wholesale. You're going to get it for for 16, you're gonna sell it for 22. Now you're gonna sell, you're gonna sell that rock for rock key and get 36 out of it, but you're gonna get the other one for 22. But why? But you moved it quick. That was fast five grand. So what am I saying? That's no different than what they're playing, but they're using you to play the game. You're the one out there selling rock for rock by buying up stuff that's that's filling their pockets. So what you gotta understand is if I'm gonna get in the game, I can't go, I can't go heavy, I can't move weight yet. I, I don't have what it takes to move weight. So what do I need to do? I need to rock for rock. I'm going to buy $5. I'm going to hold it. When, and, and I'm going to do that. And then I build enough. I'm going to do that. Or I'm going to leverage their internet. And I'm going to give people something of value that I have. Trust me, if you've been on this planet 25 years, you've learned something of value that you can provide a service. You can provide a uh, consulting uh, service. You can provide uh, some type of uh, something of value to someone. Or you can find somebody who does and promote their business and get paid as an affiliate. There's a way to make money. So then you're going to sit up and say, I'm going to take the side hustle online and I'm going to create an opportunity online. And then I'm going to take that money and I'm going to go buy me a quarter, an ounce. I'm going I'm I'm to do that. And then I'm going to use that to pour back into the business. And when I get more, I'm going to buy a half of half a half uh, a key or a quarter key and then i'm gonna buy half and then i'm gonna come back and then i'm gonna sit up and i'm gonna grow it then i'm gonna start moving weight i'm gonna start buying up houses i'm gonna start buying up uh actual full shares and instead of saying a hundred dollars a share i'm gonna buy uh ten dollars worth of a share i'm gonna actually start buying shares and i'm gonna start holding those shares because holding the shares is how you hold your net worth i'm not trying to dump everything i'm trying to accumulate diverse assets that hold and appreciate in value and will literally by simply being in my possession grow my wealth over time i'm building wealth because the the name of the game isn't simply what i can go out and buy see that's that's how they give you the consumer mindset see if i can't have the power i'll have the symbols of the power i, I that's why you got black people being last in socioeconomic relativity uh and uh, relevance, excuse me, last in socioeconomic relevance, uh, literally $150,000 gap underneath uh, whites who own 84% of the wealth. At, they're at 177,000 median household wealth and you're at 17,000, but we outspend them two to one in buying Mercedes Benz is why? Because it's the status. I may not have the power. See, I may be driving the Benz, but the person uh, that's driving the Toyota signs my checks. Because you know what? The number one car driven by millionaires in America is a Toyota Camry. The, as a matter of fact, the top 10, there's only one, one luxury vehicle in the top 10. It's a Lexus. And it's an ES. They're managing their money different. They're understanding the game. Now, there's nothing wrong with having those luxury vehicles, but it's got to be in direct correspondence to the level of uh, money you have. And I'm not just talking about cash. I'm talking about what can you afford? That should be a percentage standard of how much I have versus how much I'm going to spend on any particular specific thing. How much I'm going to spend on my home depending on how much I have. 
I'm not going to go out because they say I qualify for this and buy this. I'm not going to go out and, well, you can get a $100,000 car, but can I afford it? Does it make sense to me? Because the moment I drive the $100,000 car off the lot, it's now worth 60. So I'm literally giving away $40,000 the moment I drive it off the lot. That's why you see most wealthy people leasing. They only lease it for the time they have it. They don't lease it for the total price of the car. But they got us thinking it's about what you own. No, that's what Nelson Rockefeller said. First and foremost, he meant, and there's a couple number of things he meant. He said, the goal is to own nothing and control everything. So number one is my, my trust own all things. It's not in my name. My trust owns it. I control everything through trust. That's one thing. The other thing is, if it doesn't appreciate in value, I don't want ownership of it. I want use of it, but I don't want ownership of it. There is so much to be learned, but we have, and, 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 and the thing is, don't get me wrong. I don't want to sit up and act like there's this magic button that black people can push. What I'm sitting up saying is there are mechanisms out there. Uh, when I wrote the war on black wealth, I talked about all the different things that have worked against us in building wealth that we need to be aware of that still are prevalent in some way or still have impact on us. We got to understand that when we first came out of slavery, we had these things called black codes. What were black codes? They were codes and, and laws and statutes that wouldn't allow us to own property, that wouldn't allow us to take jobs or have businesses in certain areas because we had the expertise and the skills. Why? They had been using our labor and our skills for free for what, two, 246 uh, documented years. So then what? We're not going to let you do that because then the people who need those jobs that are white, that look like us, won't have them. So you can't have those jobs. You can't own anything like that. Then that was sharecropping where we're going to have you work the very plantations that you want. We're going to tell you you're sharing it. We're going to give you a portion of the land, tell you to work it. We're going to give you the equipment. We're going to give you the feed. We're going to give you the seeds, but we're going to charge you a price for it all. And we're going to need you to settle up at the end of harvest time. And we're going to make sure that we charge you so much that even after you work that field and you bring in, in those crops, it's not really much left for you. You're going to be barely meeting the thing. And I was reared by my great grandfather who was the son of a sharecropper. He descended from this slave uh, policy uh, he was born in 1909. The man that reared me was born in 1909. So I got real close to understanding what, what happened out there. He had to drop out at uh, the second grade at seven years old to go out in the field and help his dad work the fields just to make ends meet. So I understand that was that. So you got shit. Then you had convict leasing where they were literally locking us up for not having jobs that they wouldn't let us get. And it was called the vagrancy laws. They locked us up, the vagrancy laws. They locked us up. And then they turned around after locking us up for being vagrant, being homeless and not having a job. They turned around and leased us out to the very plantations that we had been set free for for pennies on the dollar. So no, the labor wasn't free, but it was extremely cheap. It was much cheaper than if they would have paid us to come back and actually work it. And, and, and this went on for quite some time. And then not only that, then we had redlining where we weren't allowed to buy homes because the, uh, literally any neighborhood with a black family owning a home, even if it was just one black family, would cut, uh, lost access to funding, for funding for home purchases, funding for businesses purchases. That is what literally actually made the predominance of white people hostile towards blacks because you moving in my neighborhood brings my property value down. That's where the idea came from. It wasn't that what we, how we look at it now, black people moving in, bring the property value down because they finna throw cars in the yard and all this stuff like that. That's how we view it now that they're bringing their, their ghetto mentality to my hood. Dry. No, it was that back then, if you moved in, you could have been the most upstanding Christian black family. You were going to ensure that those white people didn't get access to money that they initially had access to. So they didn't want you there. And they did that. It's called redlining. Then out of redlining came, became, uh, urban renewal and benign neglect. 
where they literally were taking properties and they and or they were taking and rediverting services that should have been in black communities out to white communities and it's called benign neglect in other words we just simply not going to give you the services that you need and through that it, we're going to create problems in health uh man so many more then th that eventually became a form of serial force displacement which we're seeing now with gentrification a another way that we're constantly being helped and so in gentrification we're actually sitting up and losing properties we've actually paid for because we can't afford the property taxes because they come in drove down the value to where uh through a bunch of different mechanisms meaningfully like literally engineering in poverty to in which automatically engineers crime if you don't get that that's one of the things that we, we lose at. We talk about crime all the time, but we don't talk about the source. Anytime poverty is present, crime is going to be present. Crime is how poor people eat, if you don't understand that. If I don't make enough money to eat, how do you think I eat? From the person who walks in and steals the baby food to the person that's out on the corner setting drugs to the person that's boosting stuff out of the department store and selling it on the street for fractions of the cost. All of that is a part of the initial survival mechanism. And there's no other group that's come through America that was initially impoverished that have enriched themselves that didn't go through that. They will sit up and pretend that there's something wrong with us, but you don't come out of poverty without a plan. The Italians, we don't have the mafia as they had it set up if they didn't go through a poverty situation where the only way that they can enrich themselves was through illegal me means and mechanisms so uh chinese triads that that found their way onto american soil they've all had these situations but they will sit up and they will make you think that it's some sort of exclusive phenomenon on blacks and then they'll talk about black on black crime and what they don't talk about is any other crime Black crime is proximal. And normally people who are in the same socioeconomic category and race tend to be around each other. They'll act that they'll they'll use black on black crime, I mean, with great frequency and so much uh nefarious intent. And they'll have you sit up thinking, man, we're just killing ourselves. Yeah, we are. That's real. And we need to work on that. We need to deal with that. But what they won't tell you is 84 percent of white uh, of, of, of white people who are killed are killed by other white people. Eighty four percent of white homicides are initiated or perpetrated by whites. It's proximal. Crime uh, is number one, normally a, a, an act of convenience or necessity. Number two, crime is norm. Crimes of violence are normally a response to emotional rage that are normally triggered by someone, you know. And so that's the, the re reality of it. But we don't hear that. And my issue has always been until we start talking about white on white crime, Asian on Asian crime. I don't want to hear about black on black crime. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. But it's not a phenomenon. It's natural. And it's going to be intensified in moments of poverty. But so you've got all of this stuff going on. They drive down the property value after they drive down the property value through a number of different things. I seen a place in Houston where one of the ways they drove, they drove down the property values, they moved a darn gone uh, sand mill, gravel pit. No, that's what it was, a gravel pit, sand pit, right there at the community, the interest of the community. Drove the property value down, some other things going on, drove property value down. All of a sudden they got the properties down. They shut down the mill. They start putting up new uh, businesses, putting up new things, decorating, starting to drive the property value up. Guess what? The people in that community, the, in, in predominant, predominantly elderly in that community that have been there since the 1940s and 50s are now being driven out because they can't afford the high property value. I mean, the high property tax. And so what happens? If you can't pay the tax, what they do? They foreclose. They literally take a property you own because you can't afford the property tax. Then they come in and they buy it all up. Now they own something that they bought for fifteen dollars, they now have it and own it, or can negotiate sale of it, and it's fifteen hundred dollars. I'm just throwing a number out there. You know, it's more than that, but I'm just sitting up saying. So they're literally doing that over and over. These are all the mechanisms. These are real. These are things that are happening. I'm not absent-minded of that. I'm saying that the way that you guard against that is you have to start building the capacity to resist it. The other thing that you do when you take on a mindset of building wealth is you start to inculcate into the mindset of your children a path different than the one you was presented with 
You don't want to put in their minds that the only way to make it is to get three jobs. You might have to at some point in your time to do something, but that can't be your end all because no matter how many jobs you get, there's only so many hours in a day. And if those jobs have this much, then this is what's going on. And uh, also there's this natural tendency to end up living at the level of whatever you do. So you go out and get three jobs. And for a while, like, hey, man, I'm busting my butt, but I got a little cushion. But what happens with the cushion? Man, I'm going to take a trip. What happens to the cushion, man? I'm going to go get them shoes I've been looking at. What happens to the cushion, man? I'm going to go from this car to that car. What happens to the cushion? We rarely have the mindset. So here's why financial literacy is important, no matter how much money you have. Because if I do decide to go get three jobs, financial literacy tells me I'm going to pay this bill and I'm going to get rid of this one. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to take this amount of money. And no matter what's going on in my life, this money is going towards an appreciative asset. going towards an appreciative asset i um talked to a guy had to be maybe during it was a, so it had to be july because it was somewhere around my birthday i talked to this guy and <clears throat> the guy by social standards a social definition is doing good nice car big house but if you listen to him and talk to you he'll be honest with you man i'm strapped I'm, I, I, you know, I'm living a life that I never lived before, but it's costing me, man. You know, if I take a major hit, it's going to it's going to totally wipe me out because I don't have any cushion. And he's honest about it and he's he's working to figure it out. But he's bought into the idea that his his success has to be supported to the public in order to be valid. In other words, I have to show them I made it in order for me to feel like I've made it. So. I'm buying these things to validate myself. It's it's where I'm seeking habit. And, and the thing is, it's a form of addiction because it, every time you get something new, it, it releases dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that literally transmits signals to, from one neuron to the other. But the problem is that it's damaging in high uh, frequency because it causes the neurons to fire rapidly. This is how you end up with <clears throat> addictive behavior, whether it's gambling, whether it's sex, whether it's drugs, is you get a high from doing something, buying something, gambling and winning, whatever. You get a high. Well, these neurons release dopamine. Dopamine gives you this excitement that you get from that high. Like, man, look at what I'm doing. And then what happens is the neuron that's receiving the message that creates the excitement realizes, hey, man, I can't keep doing this because it happened in high doses and frequency, that excitement literally starts to destroy those neural receptors and kills that neuron. So the neuron actually turns off some of the receptors so that it doesn't receive such a heavy dose. So now you're chasing the initial high, but now you gotta do what? You gotta double the dosage. I gotta buy more, I gotta smoke more, I gotta do whatever more to get the same feeling. And then when you do do that, Neuroreceptor turns down more, turns neuron turns on more receptors. Eventually, it burns out that neuron. And now that's what we reach. If we're talking alcoholism, we're talking drugs, it's called tolerance, meaning that no matter what I do, I can't get drunk. No matter what I do, I can't get that high anymore. And then it's addiction because now I just I can't stop doing it because my I'm literally trained myself to do it. So this is what happens. We're caught up in that and we're not learning how to behave so what do you have to do you have to change your mindset so again it's not about how much you have it's about what you do with what you have it's about a change of focus because i guarantee you that this is one of the things when i'm studying poverty one of the things i do most people who are at that level the tax gap, i can tell you one thing i can tell you if you, if you got an understanding if you are expecting large amounts of money in tax refunds it means you severely overpaid or you're getting tax credits and you're literally living off of that as a part of your income it's a part of your income okay i get that and if that's where you want to start what are you doing with it most people are going out and buying cars there's a new car every freaking year because the one you bought you bought for style instead of de dependability and it didn't hold on long so you've been stretching you're going on a trip everybody's going shopping to the mall all these different things are happening and you didn't take that money and sometimes i'm talking nine ten thousand dollars or more you didn't take it and actually say i'm going to buy a piece of something that i own but you'll sit up and say there's absolutely no way to escape poverty. Yes, it is. But it it comes from a change of mindset. It comes from a level of literacy. It comes from seeing things different.
Now, what you the level of literacy that you do have in poverty is lack. The mindset of lack alone will lock you in because people who fit who who have lack, who have a mindset of lack, who have a lack mentality, tend to just grasp and hold on to things. And it's going anyway because things are coming. You're going to have to have things you take care of. So squeezing won't stop it from going. It'll just stop you from focusing on how to create more of it so that you have a surplus of it and you can't be in survival mode doing that. So that's the first thing. So you've got to have a part of you that's saying no matter what, this is happening. Like I said, here are the numbers. I don't know if you can see it, that light glare. But anyway... Yeah, it's not gonna show. You might see, might can see it, and I just can't see it in, in my 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 uh, thing. But again, I took a five dollar initiative initial investment, four dollars and sixty cents a week for five years. I turned two hundred and forty five dollars total into fourteen seventy three. I literally did this my experiment because I wanted to be able to have this conversation and say this is what you do. So if I was a person and that's all I could do. I still produced more with that $240 than it would have produced, especially when you look at how uh, little I put in at any given time than it would have ever produced. There's no way that I would have sit up and produced for if if this is me and this is all I have. There's no other way I would have been able to sit up and produce that 1473 without gambling, without doing something that could have cost me everything and not have nothing. And this is consistent. That S&P 500 is performing at 9.5 to 10 percent with a 1.2, 1.3 variance, interest variance. That's like, hey, it's consistent. And it doesn't ask you if you're black. It doesn't ask you if you're male or female. It doesn't ask your educational level. It doesn't ask any of those things. You simply say, I want it. You pay for it and you hold it. And then there are some other things you need to educate yourself about how to do it. You, the best way to do that uh, um, is an IUL, uh, which will allow you to do it through a, some form of a trust that you can do it that protects you and some other things. Or you can just do it outright, but you need to educate yourself. You need to have an understanding of some of these different mechanisms that are there. So again, I am challenging you to determine that you're going to learn and develop. Don't dismiss the idea of financial literacy. No, knowing something about money isn't going to put money in your bank, but not knowing will definitely allow other people to manipulate you, will definitely leave you in a situation where you don't know. But if you do know, you have the means through which you can make a decision that actually works for you. And it's a process. So the goal is to build and one of the biggest problems we have is we live in a, a microwave society. We live in a world where instant gratification is the name of the game. It's the call of the day. What do I mean? I want to see what I'm doing now. I need it to show now. I need to be sit up there and talk. I need people to see what I'm doing. I need to feel what I'm doing. So I need something now. What happens is you're not setting up for the future. There's no uh, level or yearning or maturity that pushes you to deference. So what happens? Most of our kids are starting where we started. Wow, we didn't build anything to pass down to them. I've had people tell me, look, man, I've taken care of the kids. They better learn that stuff because when they get it and, you know, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing. Look, that should be a certain portion of what you're working for, a significant portion that's designated to the next generation. So they don't start because here's what I can tell you that the other group is doing for their children. That keeps them having a head start against your children, against our children is they are getting 50,000 to 100,000 to buy their first home. A large amount of them are having their student uh, student uh, cost to go to school covered because they planned for it from day one. This fund is going to be for college. This fund is going to be for a house. This is going to get you started. So when you have two of those people and they're coming from single, similar backgrounds, you got both parents saying we're pouring into you guys, giving you a head start while we're sending our kids out there 10 years after they graduate college. They're still trying to pay off student loans. And I'm not saying that whites don't do the same thing because they do. There's a lot of whites with student loan debt. What I'm telling you is percentage wise per capita, it's worse for us because that's our only chance to go to school is to take out those student loans because we didn't plan for it. Again, we're, 
how is it that you are literally 10 years in the work game? You're 10 years in the workforce and you're not stacking any any wealth yet because you're paying off debt. Debt is the number one enemy to wealth. They're already on the head start. How are you going to catch them? That's why the wealth gap is widening. That is an issue of financial literacy. Simply not understanding and not developing a mindset of doing something different. There's no racial cap on investing now that's some places that you go that the good old boy thing is still kicking in that's some places you can go and they ain't gonna let you in because you look like that get you a front man done it before man a bunch of different properties back when i was before the collapse when real estate was one of the heavy things i was in bunch of guys bunch of times i had guys go in as a front man for my corporation and get properties because they want to go they were going to look at me and go hell no but we are so caught up in is people need to know it's me i've got a number of different things going on online right now you couldn't look at it and tell who owns it because i'm trying to reach a different demographic i don't care if, i don't my ego doesn't pay my bills my skill set, my expertise, my awareness, and my movement pays my bills. Your ego will have your ass broke. There's, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to deny who I am, but everybody doesn't need to know what I own. Everybody doesn't need to know where it's happening. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that you can start anywhere. I started in the hood. And one of the things I developed was an unbelievable thirst for learning. I read probably a hundred times more than the average person, literally. And people think I'm crazy when I say it and don't, don't believe it, but I read a hundred plus books a year. I've written 26. I've written over a thousand, uh, academic articles, over 30,000 prose articles. And I've read hundreds for each one of those I've written. Why? Because I thirst to learn. I wasn't intimidated by the task of creating a program for blacks to learn uh, about finance and wealth building because I wanted to learn myself. Because while I knew a bunch of things, you know, I've started 47 companies in 35 years. I've written 26 books. I've got clients on multiple continents right now. Just a little black boy from the hood, but it started one day at a time. But I don't know everything. And this whole wealth building thing was a whole nother level. And what I learned from the people that I reached out to, it, I mean, even that took humbling because I'm not the person that walks in a room and gets impressed with how much money you have. I'm not a person that your, your, your net worth makes you special to me. But if you got a net worth that I can't personally hit and I want to teach people how to go after what it is, whatever it is they want, you've got information I need. So now I've got to humble myself and pursue you. Some of these guys I pursued three and four years before they accepted my invitation to sit down and talk with me, whether it was virtually, whether it was actually in person, whether it was through email. I pursued it because the information they held could change the lives of so many people that I care about by way of racial connectivity and the way I love my people. And so I took that and I put it in that 18 month course. But you've got to want something bad enough. Now, the thing is, I'm going to get off of it just real quickly and briefly about the course. The course is available right now. Uh, you can sign up and register for it. There are two ways you can pay for it in full that first link when you pay for it in full you're actually going to get two sessions with me that's a thousand dollar value in and of itself twelve hundred dollar value in and of itself you get to sit down with me um if you pay in full or you can look at the second link and you can actually go through our academy's platform and take our installment plan and you'll you'll like be able to get in that way but you can if you decide to pay in full we do have afterpay so you can still end up paying in installments but the installment plan for the school is stretched out over 12 years. I mean, 12, 12 months. Um, but whatever you do, you're responsible for your future. Expecting the people who created the problem and benefit from it to fix it is inviolable. It's ridiculous. The idea that you can't do anything about it is equally ridiculous. The problem is 
And the, and the question is, are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to make the sacrifices? Are you willing to do it differently than it's been done in the past in your family? Are you willing to be the standout that everybody's looking at and saying you're crazy? That is what you're going to have to ask yourself because all those things are going to be necessary in order to do the things that you're going to need to do to achieve something beyond what you've achieved, but it's possible. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if it wasn't possible. I wouldn't be sitting here challenging you to do something above what it is that's been done in your family. And it's always more to be done, but we need to prepare and build for our children in the future. We shouldn't be looking and projecting three generations down saying the same thing. And that's what's happening right now because we aren't building. It's easier to sit up and say that there's no value in financial literacy without resource. But if we would actually value financial literacy, we would discover resources. Literally. So I could talk about this all day and I'm trying to reel myself in. So I'm going to let that go. Look, if you want to take a, uh, a step in the right direction, you're going to have to make a move. You're going to have to come out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to make a move. You're going to have to change your thinking. You're going to have to learn the, 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 the mechanisms. You're going to have to learn the mindsets. You're going to have to learn how they think, how they talk, how they move, what instruments are they using. You're going to have to understand the legal. All that stuff is important, but you're going to have to be willing. Take one of those dollars and buy some stock. Take one of those dollars and buy some more. Take one and then start to look at what it does. Start to study it. Start to ask questions. Why does it do this? What caused that movement? What caused this movement? That's how you learn. You don't have to go to college for four years to learn it. You learn it in real time, watching the small things become larger things as you move around. And when you become more confident in what you're seeing, you make it larger. And then you make it larger, but you definitely have to take control of an index fund. That passively managed mutual fund is killing the game for so many people when you want to play long, but you're going to have to be willing to do something. And I teach all of that from 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 um, in, uh, from asymmetric risk reward, uh, diverse uh, asset allocation uh, using. Um, trust and everything else in between real estate uh insurance mechanisms all these different ways that they use to build grow and protect their wealth that we're not that's got got to be where it starts we've also got to come out of that consumer mindset and we need to come up with agendas and strategy to guard and protect our community existing communities against gentrification we're losing our wealth faster than we're building it because of gentrification We've got to do better. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. But I hope that this really brought something to you and that you can do something with it. Uh, like I said, this is a little different uh, Wealth Building Wednesday. It was 100% dedicated to the people I love. Um, we are in last place, and it's not because we are stuck. It's because we are stuck in our thinking and our unwillingness to develop an understanding about how things work and we'll consistently manipulate it. Uh, share this with someone if you believe that it has anything of value in it. Give, um, give the link, subscribe, whatever. But whatever you do, make up in your mind today that you're going to do something different and that you're going to become better. On that note, I wish you the best. I'm out of here. Take care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like it that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas 
uh, masking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Oh,